maybe for uh, time efficiency, we can uh, start to today's lecture. Um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Shalom, om swastiastu, nama budaya, salam kebajikan. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's lecture. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Michael Giovanni Bijaksono, and I'm going to be the master of ceremony for today's lecture. It's a wonderful and precious chance for me to be appointed to be the master of ceremony. Before we begin, I would like to give my appreciation to all parties involved in making this event to fruition. This event wouldn't run well without all of your contributions. In this special event, we would like to welcome all the honorable guests. I would like to welcome Dr. Kenny Chen Kang Peng and also Dr. Ade that will be the speaker at our event today and also the Honorable Dean of Faculty of Medicine of University of Sultan Agung Tirtayasa, Dr. Siti Farida, and to all the honorable guests that attended today's meeting. I would like to also welcome all the participants who joined the via Zoom to attend the seminar today. Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin this event, let us pray together according to our belief and religion to wish that this event will be beneficial for all of us and this event can run smoothly and conductively. Let us pray. Okay, time is up. Before the lecture starts, allow me to read today's agenda. The first one will be the opening of the guest lecture, and then there will be the speeches from the Honorable Dean of the Faculty of Medicines of Untirta, and then there will be a presentation by both of our lecturers and Q&A session every time the lecturers finish their presentation, followed by the giving of the certificate every time the presentation ends, and then we'll be come to the closing, and for the last agenda, there will be a photo session. Now, let us sing our national anthem, Indonesia Raya. Uh, wait a moment, uh, technical issue. Indonesia. Thank you everyone, and for the next session, we're going to be listening to Dr. Siti Farida's speech that also marks the official openings of today's guest lecture. To Dr. Siti Farida, the time is yours. Thank you, Master of Ceremony, Michael Jeffrey Wichaksono. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi Good afternoon and welcome everybody, especially for our speakers. Dr. Kenny Cheng Kengpeng and Dr. Adi Ikhwan, Specialist Anastasi, Anastasi Master Kesehatan. Firstly, we give thanks to the Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for the permission and blessing healthy of us so that we can together attend guest lecture, although through Zoom meetings. In this guest lecture, we have two interesting topics: heart and lung surgical disease. And the second, hemodynamic monitoring. And the topic we have from the expert, uh, Dr. Kenny Chengkeng from Mahkota Medical Center, Malaysia, and uh, Dr. Ade Ikhwan, anesthesiologist from 
University of Sultan Ageng Tirtayasa. So, by this guest lecture, we can learn more with implementation on this uh, from guest lecture. And this activity is implementation of a collaboration between Mahkota Medical Center Malaysia and Faculty of Medicine of Sultan Ageng Tirtayasa University Banten Indonesia as a dean of Faculty of Medicine University Sultan Ageng Tirtayasa I offer this guest lecture with saying bismillahirrahmanirrahim now listening interesting guest lecturer thank you assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Thank you, Dr. Sid Farida, for the wonderful speech. Now it's time we move on to the main session of this seminar. But before we start listening to our lecture, allow me to introduce to the moderator for today's lecture. Our moderator for today's lecture is Dr. Luisa. And I would like to read Dr. Luisa's curriculum vitae. As you can see, Dr. Luisa has a lot of experience in the medical field, including the most recent becoming student at Master Degree of Biomedical Science of University of Indonesia from 2019 until present. Dr. Luisa has also a notable formal education or qualification. As you can see, one of the most recent formal education is at the Faculty of Medicine of Andalus University, a medical profession program with GPA 3.10 in 2012 until 2014. Throughout the years, Dr. Luisa was involved in many trainings and seminars, such as simulation, master's class, high quality resuscitations training, simubir, Imeri as a participants, immediate emergency response team for the Vice President Republic of Indonesia in Southeast Asia Study Symposium, and also in Sekolah Ilmu Lingkungan UI, and etc. Other than academic achievement, Dr. Luisa is also active in organizations such as member of Indonesian Medical Association in Central Jakarta, member of Perdaweri, which stands for Perhimpunan Dokter Anti Penuaan, Wellness Aesthetic dan Regeneratif, Banten, and etc. Truly an impressive accomplishment throughout her career. So without further ado, I would like to hand over today's event to Dr. Luisa. To Dr. Luisa, the time is yours. Okay, thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. It is very delightful to welcome everybody here and also highest appreciation to our honorable speaker today. And today we'll have two special topics uh, from our speakers. The first one, will be delivered by Dr. Kenny, uh, Dr. Kenny Cheng Kang Peng from Mahkota Medical Center with topic heart and lung surgical disease. And the second one is from Dr. Ade Ikhwan uh, with topic about hemodynamic monitoring. Okay, let's get started for the first session. I'd like to invite our uh, Dr. Kenny Cheng, Dr. Kenny Cheng Kang Peng let me read a brief CV from Dr. Kenny. Uh, Dr. Kenny finished her Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery from University of Malaya and also membership of Royal College of Surgeon of Edinburgh and also Cardiothoracic Fellowship from Edinburgh and also Fellowship Congenital Cardiac Surgery from Birmingham Children's Hospital. And also Dr. Kenny has a lot of uh, amazing experience uh, as a senior C uh, cardiothoracic lecturer in University of Malaya and also cardiothoracic surgeon at University of Malaya Medical Center. And now Dr. Kenny works as a full-time consultant cardiothoracic surgeon in Mahkota Medical Center. Okay, well, with his expertise, uh, I hope all the participants can get better knowledge with, about this topic. And for this session, uh, there will be 20 minutes for presentation, Dr. Kenny, and will be followed by 10 minutes for Q&A session. Okay, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Dr. Kenny. Dr. Kenny, time is yours. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Kenny Chang from Makota Medical Center. Uh, I'm actually a cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, a, a surgeon who operates on the heart and lung, and uh, I have been working in University of Malaya for a very long time, but I've got some uh, cardiothoracic experience in, in different hospitals like uh, IGN, uh, Serdang Hospital, and also Birmingham Children's Hospital in the UK. 
So as an introduction to a heart and lung surgery, uh, as you all know, is a very expensive and labor-intensive uh, specialty. Uh, cardiothoracic surgery requires uh, intensive care and also a well-coordinated uh, teamwork. As you can see on this uh, illustration on your right-hand side, uh, cardiothoracic surgery requires a team, uh, a, a setup of team. Of course, the captain will always be the cardiothoracic surgeon, but behind the cardiothoracic surgeon, you have a lot of uh, support from uh, people like cardiac anesthetists, the perfusionist to run the bypass pump. Sometimes the cardiologist will come in to help out with uh, transesophageal echo and a host of other specialized nurses to, to ensure the success of the cardiothoracic uh, operation. So if you are going to discuss about uh, what are the diseases that, that are being operated on, heart and lung diseases that be, are being operated on, it, it basically can be divided into two areas. Huh? As the name implies, cardiothoracic consists of two words, cardiac and thoracic. So uh, as you can see on the illustration, uh, the thoracic cavity is separated from the abdomen uh, by uh, this uh, diaphragm muscle. And in this thoracic cavity houses two vital organs, which is the heart right in the center, and is being flanked by the lungs over the sides. So uh, there's a host of uh, disease that, that, that need uh, cardiothoracic uh, surgeon's treatment. We are going to uh, go into that. I'm going to kickstart the discussion uh, with thoracic diseases because uh, this is uh, usually the neglected specialty. Nobody talks about it. Uh, everybody talks about the cardiac operation and the cardiac disease, but by and large, a lot of people need uh, thoracic uh, surgical help. So I'm going to save cardiac diseases the best for last. So uh, to, to discuss about what are the thoracic conditions that require operations, First and foremost, you can have uh, tumors, mass uh, in the mediastinal area uh, that require surgery. And then uh, we also see a lot of pneumothorax, uh, which is air being entrapped in the uh, lung fields that require some intervention. And if it's uh, the fluid or pus uh, collected inside rather than air, it's called the empyema. Uh, this needs a surgical treatment as well. And then if you discuss about thoracic diseases, you could not run away from lung cancer, huh? one of the staple uh, uh, disease that we handle. And of course, uh, one, some of the common other common conditions that I encounter that are operate on are things like hyperhidrosis, which is the sweaty palms. Huh? So uh, first and foremost, what is media, mediastinum? Huh? As you can see from this illustration, right in front of the heart, beneath the uh, sternal bone, there is a small cavity known as the anterior mediastinum and in this area, house a small organ uh, which involutes with time as you grow older, which is the thymus gland. So this thymus gland can be enlarged. Uh, tumors can grow from here. Uh, as you can see from the CT scan, uh, it's well encapsulated. And usually, these type of tumors uh, require uh, removal uh, and resection. Besides thymus gland being, uh, uh, being a problem in the anterior mediastinum, you can also have a host of other different tumors uh, such as uh, this on your right hand side, uh, it is known as a teratoma, uh, in which you have, can have a big mass or tumor that's, that's usually invading into the lung tissue. And you can also have lymphoma as well uh, in this uh, mediastinal area. So, what we can do is that we can put in a scope to biopsy it, or if it's resectable, we usually uh, open the chest and remove the tumor in its uh, entirety. Coming on to another condition is this uh, pneumothorax. As you can see, the lung fields from the x-ray left and right is different. Huh? Uh, on the right lung, you can see the lung is totally collapsed. Huh? And these are all air entrapment. And if you are to do a CT scan, this is how it looks like. You have air being entrapped and the lung is being compressed. So in these situations, uh, usually they will require a chest tube huh, in which uh, the the air will be uh, removed, safely removed, and the lung will re-expand itself. But there's a small proportion of people, probably 20%, uh, pneumothorax does not resolve with chest tube insertion. And this kind of patient re usually require a small surgery in which we can use a videoscopic surgery, uh, which is also known as wet surgery, uh, videoscopic assisted uh, thoracic surgery. Uh, put in a camera, put 
uh, put in a few small instruments through small keyhole incisions, identify uh, the pathological area of the lung, and then uh, you can uh, remove it and staple it off. And then the lung will re-expand itself because the air is no longer leaking from the ruptured pulley. And uh, the lung can re-expand and that solves the problem. Uh, what about other things being entrapped? Uh, if it's not the air, you can have fluids and if it gets infected, it's called pus and pyma uh, and come in different stages. And if you have to do a CT scan on this patient, this is how it looks like. Uh, a collection, well demarcated pus. Uh, it will show you how big it is, how is it related to the lung tissue. And then if you have pus that's matured more than four weeks, usually they will require surgery, in which we will need to do a thoracotomy uh, to wash out all the pus. We expand the lung and then... Uh, uh, put in some temporary chest tube and close back. So moving on to another condition, which is the lung cancer. Uh, it's actually one of the commonest cancer in the whole wide world. Uh, the problem with lung cancer is that a huge proportion of the patients are actually asymptomatic. By the time they come to the doctors uh, for symptoms, such as a pain, uh, coughing out blood, and then shortness of breath, they are usually in the late stage, unfortunately. And uh, cardiothoracic surgeons usually can only operate on stage 1 and stage 2 tumors. So as you can see, our left lung and right lung is slightly different. Uh, you have two lobes on the left side, three lobes on the right side. So if it grows, the tumor grows on the top, upper lobe, we have to do an upper lobectomy in its entirety. If it grows at the lower lobe, we have to remove the whole lower lobe. And then if it grows right in the fissure involving both lobes, the whole lung tissue on one side, have got to go. Huh? You have to perform a pneumonectomy. So if you are to do a CT scan, this is how it looks like. Huh? They come in different shapes and sizes. Huh? Some are bigger, some are smaller, some are more centrally located. Most of them are periphery located, but they have this uh, common feature of irregular borders and speculated ends huh? that will tell you uh, that this is most likely a cancerous lesion. So moving on, another condition that I usually encounter is this uh, hyperhidrosis surgery. Uh, as you can see from the photos, uh, this patient usually have uh, excessive sweating over the palms, foot, or the axilla, the armpit. And uh, there's no uh, cause to it. Uh, nobody knows why this happens. And uh, there's no effective medical treatment as well. You can try medication, beta blockers, ion phoresis, uh, or some Botox injection, but it will never be long-lasting and will never be effective. The only way to solve this problem is via a small surgery in which you put in a camera into the axilla and burn the sympathetic nerve. Huh? You perform a sympathectomy. This is a short procedure. It'll probably take around 10 minutes on one side. You have to do both sides. Uh, in less than half an hour, the surgery will be completed and the effectiveness is instantaneous. Uh, the palms will, will uh, instantly dry on the operative uh, table itself. Okay, highly effective. Okay, that's the only treatment for hyperhidrosis, which is to do a wet sympathectomy. So now moving on to cardiac diseases. Uh, uh, we usually hear people go for bypass surgery, bypass surgery, or the valve surgery. So for me, mainly there are three main categories heart diseases, coronary artery disease, uh, in which you do a bypass surgery to bypass the blood vessels, or you do valve surgery to replace or to repair the uh, involved valve. And then for me personally, I have a congenital pediatric uh, expertise as well. I train in that as well. So this is a totally separate category altogether. So to start off with coronary artery disease, in Malaysia, almost 80% of heart surgeries in the dog are due, due to coronary artery disease in which you need to do a bypass surgery. So almost 80% uh, are, are bypass surgeries. The remainders are all valvular heart disease, valve surgeries. So it is due to blockage of coronary arteries, as you can see from the illustration. As time goes by, you have uh, deposition, plaques, and cholesterol that will narrow down the uh, heart vessels, the coronary vessels. So what are the risk factors that cause these blockages? Uh, that will include the common diseases that we hear all the time, such as uh, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, cholesterol, and old age. And it goes without saying, our most uh, famous bypass patient in Malaysia is our ex-Prime Minister, Dr. Mahade, that has undergone this bypass surgery not once, but twice. So how do they present? They present 
in a spectrum of uh, symptoms. Huh? From one extreme end, you can have people totally with no symptoms, uh, walking around, being well, not knowing that they have coronary artery disease. On the other extreme end, they can suddenly collapse and die off, which is uh, called sudden cardiac death. So in between, you have people, in between these two extremes, you have people with uh, chest pain, some uh, lethargy and tiredness, reduced effort tolerance, and then uh, shortness of breath, and etc. etc. So by and large, uh, chest pain and reduced effort tolerance are the commonest symptoms in coronary artery disease. So if you are to do an angiogram in these patients, uh, which is the gold standard, you will know where the blockages are. As you can see, the vessels are fat and juicy. As it comes down, it tapers off. Okay, these are the block areas, stomatic areas. And then the right coronaries is big and juicy and it's come down and it's, it, it tap, tapers over the stomatic area. These are the problematic areas. So you must be wondering how bypass surgery is done. I have a short video. Uh, you, guys can, you guys can have a look. The heart muscle. After the anesthesia takes effect, the surgical area will be scrubbed with a special disinfectant soap and may also be shaved. The surgeon will then make a six to eight inch incision down the middle of the chest. The breastbone is then separated, the heart sac is carefully pulled back, and the heart is examined. At this point, the doctor will remove the necessary graft vessels for the artery bypass. <laughs> Most commonly, an artery from the chest called the mammary artery and or a vein from the leg are used. However, an artery from the arm or wrist may also be used. Once this is done, the bypass procedure can continue. At this point, the heart will need to be cooled to keep it still. During this time, the heart will be connected to the heart-lung bypass machine. After giving a large dose of a blood thinning medicine called heparin to make sure that the blood does not clot, the surgeon will connect the heart to the heart-lung bypass machine with a plastic tube. Blood from the heart is then sent to the bypass machine through this tube. The machine supplies the blood with oxygen and then pumps it back to the rest of the body through the other tube. While connected, the blood simply bypasses the heart and lungs but still reaches the rest of the body. After being connected to the heart-lung bypass machine, each of the blocked coronary arteries will be carefully inspected. The surgeon will determine the ideal place to attach the new vessel or vessels. Usually, the vessel is sewn into an area below the blockage and then into a location in the aorta. When your heart resumes its normal function and can support your body with its own pumping ability, it will slowly be removed from the heart-lung bypass machine. Because everyone's heart is different, the time it takes to be removed from the bypass machine varies. If your heart is slow to return to its normal function, several options are available to help it regain strength. These include medication through your IV, or electrical stimulation from small thin wires called pacing wires to help your heart beat normally until your own heart's electrical system has recovered. These wires are placed directly onto the surface of your heart and will be left inside your chest during your hospital recovery. Usually these are temporary and should be removed prior to your going home. But in some patients, the wires may need to be replaced by a permanent pacemaker. Several chest tubes will also be placed inside the chest to collect any fluid that drains into the spaces around the heart and lungs. These help to ensure that the lungs and heart are working properly. Lastly, the breastbone is brought back together with thick steel wire. This helps the breastbone to heal and prevents movement. The skin incision is then closed with stitches and a sterile bandage is applied. So uh, that is the conventional bypass surgery. Uh, but in the recent 10 or 20 years, there have been a lot of changes, a lot of advancements to how people do bypass surgery. And uh, one of the examples is that conventionally, we used to open the leg with a large incision, a uh, long incision throughout the leg uh, from the ankle joint up to the thigh. Uh, but nowadays, for example, these are example of two patients that I did in Makota Medical Center uh, in which uh, I use a minimal invasive endoscopic technique uh, which will uh, require just a 3cm scar uh, just behind the knee. 
to harvest the, the saphenous vein rather than a big long incision throughout the leg. So this will this this, this will be advantageous in terms of cos cosmesis, uh, pain, faster recovery, and less incidence of wound infection as well. So these are actually uh, some of my patients uh, in Makota Medical Center that I use the scope for harvest. And uh, there's a whole there's a host of other new new advancement as well, uh, like, uh, such as a bilateral IME uh, rather than single IME and uh, total arterial and, and et cetera, et cetera. So that there's a lot of new new techniques and new gimmicks uh, for the recent 10 years uh, that, that only the new generation of surgeons are, are, are accustomed to. You know? uh, the older older surgeons might, might not be able to do it because they're not trained in it. So moving on to valvular heart disease, as you know, heart has got four valves. Uh, and these valves uh, can be either stenotic or regurgitant, just like your valves at home in your, in your water pipe. So we will try our best to repair. Uh, if it's not amenable to repair, then unfortunately we will have to replace the whole valve. And if you are going to replace, there are two types of valve. Uh, you have a tissue valve and also plastic mechanical valve. Type of valve being used will depend on the age of the patient. And moving on, uh, another category of heart surgery is uh, pediatric congenital, uh, which is uh, way more complex, way more challenging than adult surgery, uh, which I train in as well. Uh, in a few places, especially Birmingham Children's Hospital. Huh? Uh, you have a spectrum of complexity. Huh? The commonest one, easy ones will be like PDA ligation. And then what is the other common problem that you hear about children? Huh? Hole in the heart. Hole in the heart, you have many types. You have ASD, VSD, AVSD, and then more complicated ones will be uh, tetralogy of fellow. And it doesn't stop there. Congenital problems, you have plenty full of uh, problems uh, which we usually come under complex congenital operations. So uh, this is way more difficult, way more challenging. As, as you can see, the child is only one palm size of an adult. So you imagine how small can the heart and the uh, vessels be for the, for the neonate. So uh, it's way more challenging, way more difficult than adult. I mean, for me, adult cardiac surgery is just a piece of cake. Okay. So uh, with that, I end my short presentation. I thank you for your attention yeah, and time. Uh, maybe I'll pass the floor back to the host. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kenny. I guess this topic is very useful for our participants. And this topic also very, um, as, a, as a doctor or medical staff, of course, we are exposed to this kind of cases. And... Also for the participants, uh, we we move to next session for the Q and A session. Uh, for the all the participants, if you want to ask question, you may uh, drop your question in the chat box, or you can raise hand. Uh, all right, wait. Okay, I guess we have a question, Doctor Kenny from. Dr. Regi. Yeah, I'm reading the question. You are asking about flow meter, okay? Uh, yeah. You are asking about author of the article, okay? So basically, I think you read the paper, the article on flow meter by University of Malaria, in which I, 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 I am involved because I'm a co-author, obviously, in the same unit. Yes, uh, flow meter technique is pertinent to modern cardiothoracic practice. The old surgeons, they don't use flow meter because they are so used to it. But, you know, by... by by and large, flow meter is a quality control uh, device in which you can quantitatively measure the graphs that you construct uh, to prove that you have done a good job on your CABG. You can do all CABG graphs and things like that, but you, you might not know you are not anastomosing properly, the flow is not good and it's not going to last. So with flow meter, is, uh, quality is validated and quantitatively measured. Okay, So there are values to it. And uh, in private hospitals in Malaysia, Makota is the only second private hospital to have this flow meter. Uh, they bought it after I joined this hospital. They never had a flow meter. The only flow meter in the whole Malaysia in a private hospital setting, uh, there, there was only one. Until I came to Makota, I, I, I managed to bring in the flow meter. So uh, Makota is, is only the second hospital, private hospital in the whole Malaysia to have that. Uh, yes, it's, it's pertinent, but you know, there, there are a lot of new things in modern cardiothoracic practice, uh, which the, the, the old surgeons, the senior surgeons are not accustomed to. They don't know, they, they, 
don't know how to use all these new devices and they, they, they are, might not be trained to use it as well. So I think flow meter for me is standard because in my early days of training, I, I was training with a guy who, who, who routinely used it. So I, I routinely use it as well. And then uh, that's why when I came to my quarter, I said without flow meter, I don't feel safe. Huh? In fact, you, you, you have peace of mind knowing that you've done a good job. You know, you know things if go, don't go well, huh, they can, they, they, you won't know who will get into trouble. At least you, you have a proof to say that you've done a good job. The rest recovery is beyond your control and things like that. So at least you know you have constructed good graphs and done a good job. Yes, flow meter is very important in my practice. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kenny. So I can conclude that uh, flow meter is very useful in uh, modern cardiac uh, invasive uh, surgery and it is very helpful. And of course, for, um, for a good uh a good prognosis for the patient also yeah yeah for quality control as well to the surgery that you do you know and you convince the cardiologist that you're doing a good job you don't know what the cardiologist think of you and they might uh you know have uh, a lot of funny comments and remarks you know then in a way you can protect the institution and then you can also uh uh, give some confidence to the cardiologist uh, that you, you actually can do a good job. Well. Okay, thank you, Dr. Candy. So, uh, we can move to the second uh, question, I guess. From actually, the second question from Dr. Cherry. Maybe Dr. Cherry wants to ask directly to Dr. Kenny, Dr. Cherry. Um, let, okay, okay, we move to, okay, Dr. Cherry, the question, is there implementing personalized medicine related to reduced drug response, for example, due to genetic changes in enzyme that metabolize clopidogrel in patient with SCS or getting PCI? Can you uh, get that? Truth be told, uh, I'm, not, I'm not an expert uh, to these uh, genetics and enzymes. Uh, but if you are to go to the practice guideline in the ESC guidelines, the European Society of Cardiology and also the, uh, uh, the American HA guidelines, uh, antiplatelets like clopidogrel and mesprin is, is a class one uh, recommendation. So where, where, whether they have genetic changes, enzyme uh, uh, mutation or whatever, you will have to put them on antiplatelets, double antiplatelets. In fact, all my patients for one year, double antiplatelets. So uh, I can't comment much on the genetic changes or the e effectiveness of the antiplatelets because this is uh, not my, my specialty, but we routinely put them on double antiplatelets for one year. And then uh, downwards, single antiplatelet beyond one year. And there's a question by Michael. Huh? Yeah, Michael. Yes. Is there a phenomenon where the patient shouldn't have possibly survived because of their condition, but you still perform thoracic surgery? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on, on, on who the practicing surgeon is. Huh? And you must know in private practice, there's a lot of hanky-panky, a lot of funny things going on. Huh? But for me personally, if you don't need surgery or know it, for example, if you know that you're going to die of lung cancer and at the same time you, you, you have heart condition, I wouldn't go and operate on your heart knowing that your lifespan is probably going to be less than four weeks or so or six weeks because you already have terminal, terminally ill cancer. So what, what, what are you trying to achieve, right? And it's not operable cancer, but yeah, you have some heart conditions, some valvular heart disease or, or, or critical stenosis. I wouldn't jump on it. You know, uh, I, I've seen it happen. Huh? Uh, I think, I think uh, uh, that, that, that much I can say. So uh, the rest, I think you can figure out yourself. You know? So for me personally, no. If you don't need it, I don't press for it. Okay? I, I, I only do surgery when they are beneficial for you. Huh? But uh, you must be aware that different people have different practice and uh, different agenda as well. Okay? I hope that answers your question. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kenny. Uh, we still have a last question, I guess, from Muhammad Zulfatli, Dr. Hyper hyperhidrosis. Yes. I don't really follow it. Is there any difference in clinical side between hyperhidrosis and normal physiology when work out? No, you have hyperhidrosis is hyperhidrosis. You know you have abnormal sweating 24 hours a day, persistently sweating. And it's, it's, it's bothersome for you because you can't even hold a pen properly or hold the steering wheel properly. You know, it affects a lot of uh, uh, teenage students going for exams. Uh, they will wet the exam paper. They can't hold the pen properly to sit for exams. 
Uh, and then, uh, you know, some of them will feel shy when they start dating, you know, when they, are, they want to hold the girlfriend's or the boyfriend's hand, uh, they, feel, they feel awkward, uh, meeting new people, shaking hands. You will know it's different ph physiology, normal physiological from hyperhidrosis. Hyperhidrosis happens non-stop and it's excessive, okay? It's not related to exercise as well. Okay, so it's constantly, uh, constantly swaying, not only uh, for normal... No, not exercise, uh, yeah. Exercise. yeah. You will be sweating even though you're not exercising. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kenny. Uh, I guess all of the questions already answered uh, from Dr. Kenny. And thank you for all the participants. And I guess uh, for uh, Dr. Kenny, thank you for your um, information. Uh, I hope the participant also get a very better knowledge from you. And, and for the next topic, we will... Uh, invite Dr. Ade Ikhwan Sultan, uh, specialist anesthesi MCAS. Okay, let me read uh, his CV. For, for, okay, Dr. Ade Ikhwan uh, with topic uh, hemodynamic uh, monitoring. And Dr. Ade finished uh, his Bachelor of Medicine and his specialist uh, in anesthesiology from Pajajaran University. And also uh, Dr. Ade now works as lecturer at Sultan Agung Kitatayasa Medical Faculty since 2019, and also attending anesthesiologist at Hermina Hospital Chirwas, uh, Hermina Hospital Chilgon, and also Permata Serdam Hospital. Okay, Dr. Ade, for this session, we will uh, have 20 minutes for the presentation and followed by 10 minutes of uh, Q&A session. Okay, Dr. Ade, uh, time is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Luisa, for, Luisa for uh, uh, the time. Um, can uh, audience see my, my screen? Yes, Dr. Adi. Yes, sir. Okay. Very Thank clear. you. All right. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, uh, all the audience, especially mm -hmm. Dr. Kenny uh, from Malaysia, from uh, Mahkota Medical Center Melaka, uh, Malaysia. Uh, in this uh, uh, session I will uh, present something about hemodynamic monitoring this is something that uh, I do a lot in in my work so what is what what about uh, the monitoring why, why should we monitor the hemodynamic the thing is uh, hi, uh, hemodynamic comes from uh, word hemo or hemo is which is which means blood and dynamic which means constant change so the hemodynamic it means the it will change constantly so why this blood is constantly changing. This hymo or this blood thing is constantly changing to serve its main purpose in delivering oxygen to tissues and cells. So we should ask, does blood deliver other things? Yes, but nothing as crucial as oxygen. Uh, is such a blood flow stop for five minutes to our brain and our brains will start dying. So sometimes some of our body tissue needs more oxygen, such as uh, increase in tissue activities, just like this uh, uh, athlete is doing a lot of uh, physical activity. High, higher physical activity means more metabolism increase uh, and then increase uh, energy consumption. And of course, you need oxygen to, for the cell respiration. And other times, uh, our blood tissue uh, it, it will it will increase its metabolism, such as this uh, this little girl here having a fever. Every time uh, your body temperature increase, uh, the metabolism will increase. Increase in metabolism need more uh, energy, and more energy means needs more oxygen for cell res uh, cell uh, respiration and something that people forget that anxiety is like also a form of uh, increased metabolism because your brain just never stop thinking even during your sleep you're still thinking and uh, work the heart the, the brain that never stop thinking it means it will stimulate other organs such as respiration such as uh, your heart your 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 kidney your your liver too operate as well at higher uh, metabolism level. So increase this metabolism and it needs more oxygen. And other times there are oxygen supply problem to tissues. Maybe the problem is the oxygen source, such as the oxygen concentration in the air is low, such as the bad air quality that we have in uh, air pollution. Maybe the problem is the, uh, the flow of air to the lung, uh, example for the asthmatic patient or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patient who has uh, obstruction to the lung uh, uh, through the bron bronchus. Maybe other problem is oxygen diffusion to the lung uh, in case of lung infection. 
the the thickening of the alveoli and the feeling of fluid in the alveoli will uh, will uh, will disrupt the the oxygen diffusion uh, to the bloodstream and maybe the problem is the blood pumping mechanism for example in the heart disease you can see here uh, uh, the 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 picture of the heart on the right is has a, a thinner uh, muscle tissue i mean that it it has less capability in doing the uh, blood pumping less capability mean uh, lower uh, is a uh, is lower blood flow, it means lower oxygen supply. And other time, the problem is the blood vessel, such as in Marfan syndrome, where the patient has longer limbs, like arm, longer arms, longer legs, and it will have overstretched blood vessels. And then other time, a patient has peripheral artery disease. Uh, other time has uh, sclerosis and hardening of a uh, blood vessel because of high lipid profile in, and also in diabetic patients. And also do not forget that obese person has a lot of uh, fat tissue surrounding its blood vessel and will increase its systemic vascular resistance. Or maybe the problem is the blood itself. Some patient has some people has larger than normal total systemic blood volume because of maybe he, he or she has a high glucose concentration, such as a high carbohydrate intake or in diabetic patient. That we have to understand that higher glucose concentration in our blood it will bind to more water bind to more water i mean we have we'll have more a larger plasma volume and then larger plasma volume is a more is a, a heavier work for the our heart to pump maybe we should only have like three a half liter 3.5 liter of blood volume but because of a high a high glucose level we may have like four to 4.5 liter of uh, blood volume which is more work for our uh, heart to circulate and also may have a uh, larger blood uh, volume may be present in person with uh, increased sodium intake such as present in salt and food seasoning food additives uh, preservatives and emulsifiers so they are all sodiums and sodium will bind to hi uh, hydroxide and it will hydroxide come from water so more sodium it means more uh, more uh, blood volume may also uh, the problem from the blood is the increase uh, overall overall blood viscosity such as uh, in a person with a high lipid profile or in a person with polycythemia who has like a, a high very high concentration of hemoglobin in uh, his or her blood so Whenever the, there is a, an increase of oxygen demand or a decrease in oxygen supply or problem in higher, uh, high blood volume of viscosity, it will result in increase in cardiovascular and respiratory work. And then what uh, our cardiovascular system will do, it will increase blood flow. So, and so the end result is minimizing oxygen deficit. So maybe this, so this is a good thing. So uh, we can depend on our cardiovascular system to compensate for uh, our increasing demand of oxygen or maybe uh, uh, other, uh, other condition that will need uh, more work from uh, our, uh, our cardiovascular system. This is a good thing actually. But the problem that we want the, uh, our the hemodynamics to set the, within the safe limit because uh, sustained stress for an extended period on cardiovascular system is potentially dangerous. And also hemodynamic parameters exceeding safe limits may also indicate the possibility of current pathology or current injury to body tissue. So this is why we do. Why this is why we need monitoring because monitoring basically just repeating the same measurement over and over again. So what uh, parameters that we can use? Uh, we can we can start from the very simple one. Some parameters are uh, very easy to measure, like pulse rate, pulse feeling. We can we, we can check with our fingers. See the the, uh, the pictures here. We can check the pulse on heart, on uh, arms, on neck, or also on uh, our feet. Uh, um, wait, 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 wait. Uh, also, the heart rate we can is easily to check the heart rate with very simple uh, device such as stethoscope, or maybe you can even just stick your 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 ear to the person's uh, chest, but that's not ethical to do. So we just use a stethoscope and also measure blood pressure with hydromanometer with stethoscope. So we can see in the picture here, uh, 
some uh, medical student performing a social duty uh, on uh, on the latest uh, Banten flood victim a few weeks ago. And also now oxygen measuring oxygen saturation in a continuous pool is uh, is very easy because the, the the device is affordable. We can buy like the device for the low quality one for as low as forty thousand uh, rupiah. Uh, maybe the uh, the quality is low low much lower than the the one like that cost two to five million. But uh, the device still do. Also, we move to more advanced. Some parameters need more complicated tool to measure, such as continuous heart rate. Uh, we can use a machine here with continuous ECG. Also, we can also measure continuous uh, automatic non-invasive blood pressure monitoring using the oscillometry method. In this monitor, we can also see the respiratory rate at the bottom, the yellow one. And we can also see the temperature measurement on the bottom right. So, and this is uh, now become more available because the price is much lower than, uh, than 15 to 20 years ago. Other hemodynamic parameter that uh, also we, uh, is more advanced is like invasive blood pressure monitoring. Uh, usually, uh, before when I did anesthesia for cardiac surgery, we use this. Also, central venous pressure monitoring, pulmonary artery pressure monitoring. Uh, all these three, uh, we usually use the invasive method. It means that we insert this, the probe sensor inside the uh, the person blood vessel inside the blood vessel. So we insert insert uh, in artery for uh, invasive blood pressure monitoring, central venous pressure monitoring. We insert the the probe inside the central vein, and then pulmonary artery pressure. We insert the probe inside the pulmonary artery. So we can see the from the screen here the red one. That's the invasive blood pressure monitoring. It it is uh, the blood pressure is measured uh, at every heartbeat. So if our heartbeat uh, like this, uh, it has like eighty beats a minute. It will measure the blood pressure eighty times a minute. So it's uh, very very accurate and very very fast uh, measurement. That's very good. But it also has a uh, Highly, very, uh, very costly, and uh, has more uh, uh, complication. Yeah. For more, more advanced, we can also use uh, measure cardiac output, cardiac index. Now, uh, some measurement of this uh, these parameters also use non-invasive method. Uh, this is, uh, but we are not uh, wide. Uh, the, the method. It's not widely accepted yet, maybe because uh, there, is, there is some skepticism and also the price. The price is still quite costly. Uh, it's around, uh, the cheapest is around 600 million rupiah uh, unit. And still skepticism whether the, the measurement still is uh, as accurate as the invasive one. See, we can see here the right one is the invasive blood pressure monitoring. The purple at the bottom is non-invasive blood pressure monitoring. See, we can see that the invasive and non-invasive is not the same because the non-invasive is, we can see here, the, the interval is 15 every 15 minutes, but uh, the invasive uh, monitoring is every heartbeat. And the yellow one, I think we can see this pulmonary, uh, pulmonary artery pressure i think yeah and then the ninth, the the blue one is the oxygen saturation the white one is the respiratory rate and the green one is the uh, heart rate all right more advanced uh, we can also use uh, major systemic vascular resistance pulmonary vascular resistance uh, stroke a systemic pressure variation, stroke volume variation, pulmonary pulse pressure. Also, we can measure central venous oxygen saturation and jugular bulb oxygen saturation. It's very advanced, but uh, uh, we do not routinely use it because it's also very uh, costly to, uh, to, to operate. 
Some hemodynamic parameters require blood sampling, such as blood gas analysis. So you can use, take the sample from arterial or venous. You can also measure the blood lactate level. So uh, here, the, the example in the picture is the arterial blood gas, blood, blood gas analysis. You can use the pH, uh, the carbon dioxide pressure, uh, oxygen pressure in the, in the, in the blood, in the arterial blood, can also uh, measure the blast excess and also base excess and also uh, measure the uh, oxygen saturation, which is here 98.5%. So how to manage the result? How to manage your findings? So first of all, you need to find out what the normal results are. So normal results are proven by research, statistic, and based on evidence. So now it's very easy to find the normal result and the normal result uh, may be revised over the years. So we just can type the, and search it in the internet and it will, it will pop, up, pop, up, uh, pop, uh, pop out to us. But the thing that we really need to understand, we need to understand the physiology. Why this and this happen? Why we find this result? And also, if we uh, use, uh, uh, we also treat the patient at the same time using medicine. We need also to understand the pharmacology of the, our medicine. What is effect on the patient? What is effect on the physiology? And what will it affect on the uh, the finding on the hemodynamic findings, such as different result while well, the patient is active or the patient is resting? It's just a simple example. We will uh, talk about uh, more examples later. So you need to relate your abnormal findings with the patient condition. This is what uh, I, would, uh, I would like to ask to the, all the medical practitioners, especially to the young doctors, because I, I, often, I often find out that young doctors just uh, want to treat the numbers, not treat the patient condition. So I would like, as to all acknowledge that what are the underlying patient conditions that cause this change in hemodynamic parameters? We can just start from very simple thing. Do, you, do, do we think that the patient has anxiety? Do you think that the patient has any pressure or problem at work? Any problem at home? What, what do we think? Do we, do, do we think that the patient has, has unhealthy uh, uh, lifestyle because lifestyle may relate to blood sugar level, lipid profile, obesity? How is the patient's health condition? How is the blood vessels doing? Does the patient experience any trauma? Does the patient experience any blood loss? Do we think that the patient has any respiratory problem, such as lung infection, cough, or like uh, uh, asthma, or uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, or any infection that uh, may we need to we need to uh, consider? Any problem with hormones? Uh, any problem with liver, kidney, or thyroid, or adrenal? So, please. Don't just treat the number. We need to dig out what are the underlying conditions that this person uh, that come to us that that might create this uh, this diversion in uh, a hemodynamic finding, a diversion from normal, whether it is increased, whether it is uh, decreased, or whether the number just uh, slightly uh, increased or extremely increased. So. Let's say that we find abnormalities in hemodynamic parameters. We should start, for first, we should start asking ourselves, is the finding mild? Is the finding moderate? Or is the finding extreme? So we can see from the example beside on the left is, is blood pressure 150 over 93. With the blood, uh, heart rate is 77. Maybe it is uh, classified as the uh, or moderate uh, hypertension, if I'm not mistaken. But then, then we need to look for the complication that this patient uh, has uh, with him or with her. Does he has headache, blurred vision, fatigue, dizziness, dyspnea, cough, uh, 
any decrease of consciousness or any other thing that may uh, we can use uh, to relate the finding uh, to the, uh, relate the condition to the finding. So one, once again, the more severe the clinical complication, the more aggressive we need to manage the patient. And the more aggressive we need we manage the patient, the more frequent we need to monitor the hemodynamic. So the frequency, the type of the parameters, then the frequency of monitoring it really depends on actually the clinical complication and how aggressive our treatment to the patient. So, for example, that we already start our treatment, and then after several next monitoring, we find out that we miss our goal to our patient. So we just, okay, we miss your treatment goal to your patient. What should you do? You should evaluate your treatment. Don't just think that it will, it will correct itself. Have we overlooked anything? Has anything that we, has any, uh, the patient has any condition that we overlooked before? We try to evaluate. If we still cannot, be not sure, we should ask for help on consultation. So we, I would like to show several examples of, uh, of uh, monitoring, such as uh, this is a case of mild increase of uh, blood pressure such as the, the condition is patient come with uh, in your general checkup with no clinical complaint. We just evaluate the patient. We try to find the underlying medical condition, educate the patient about the condition that we found and prescribe medication. And then we may ask the patient to return to our work, uh, to our practice uh, after three or five days, maybe. So the, the, so here we need to understand the patient condition that this condition is mild, it has, uh, he or she doesn't have any clinical complaint, complaint. Then the time that we need to patient to return to us, sometimes really depend on the, the pharmacology of uh, the medicine that we, we, that we prescribe. So do, you, do we think that the, the peak, uh, uh, the peak uh, work of the the medicine is two days, three days, or maybe five days, it will reach its full potential. So we will ask the patient to, uh, to uh, return at, 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 at that time because the patient doesn't have anything that uh, serious that we need to take care of. Next case is like a case of um, moderate or high increase of blood pressure. pressure may, patient may come with fatigue and headache we should evaluate the underlying medical condition, educate the patient about our uh, finding, about his or her condition, and may, we may prescribe medication. If the condition is uh, like moderate, like the, the, uh, the blood pressure might be 150 over 90, we may monitor every day to, uh, bec uh, when, uh, just to make sure that the, 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 the medicine that we, we, we prescribe will work correctly. But, if the condition is quite a severe, uh, high, like the blood pressure around 170, 180, over 90, or over 100, we may uh, ask the patient to stay at our clinic for a few hours. Uh, we, we start uh, a, a medication that we may, we want, we want to make sure that patient return home at us, uh, with uh, blood pressure at several level. So, uh, and also, the uh, uh, decrease in uh, in com uh, in uh, clinical symptoms such as uh, the one this one is in the fatigue and the headache. Other case of uh, increase uh, high or extreme increase of blood pressure, patient may come with headache or blurred vision, may come with decrease of consciousness, sleepy, motor weakness, may come with dyspnea or chest pain. So. In this case, uh, patient with uh, extreme medical, uh, extreme increase in blood pressure, we may need to admit the patient to hospital or to, 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 to inpatient, inpatient hospital or clinic. So we can monitor frequently, such as stroke, uh, simple stroke, we may need to uh, uh, monitor every two hours. Maybe a uh, more severe stroke, we may need to uh, monitor the patient every 15 to 30 minutes. 
hypertensive urgency such as the blood pressure over 180 over 100 we need, we may need to 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 monitor the patient's um, hemodynamic every one hour uh, and hypertensive emergency like such as the blood pressure over 220 250 we may need to operate uh, monitor the patient every 15 minutes while we start administering also like uh, uh, intravenous uh, uh, anti-hypertensive drug because intravenous anti-hypertensive drug it 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 works very quickly it work, it it works from its uh, onset of action is just like 5 to 10 minutes so we need to measure the the condition uh, quickly and also uh, more frequently. Case of tachycardia with elevated or decreased uh, blood pressure, such as in septic shock, in, which has increased in oxygen demand, ischemic heart attack, decrease in stroke volume, pulmonary infection with labor breathing, which is a problem with oxygen diffusion. We may need to monitor blood pressure every few minutes, maybe every five to 15 minutes, followed by continuous monitoring of ECG, heart rate, pulse, and oxygen saturation. Also, case of uh, decreased blood pressure and tachycardia, we can find it in patients with trauma and undergoing operation with major blood loss. We may need to monitor blood pressure and other hemodynamic every uh, two and five minutes, continuous, uh, and also continuous monitoring of ECG, heart rate, pulse, and oxygen saturation. And we may need to replace blood loss with fluid and blood component. And also we can see here case of advanced monitoring. This is what uh, Dr. Ken is uh, daily work. I think. So patient who undergoing heart surgery, we may need to monitor the blood pressure at each heartbeat using invasive blood pressure monitoring because Dr. Kenny will main work is to manipulate the heart on the cardiac surgery. So the performance of the heart may fluctuate very, very quickly. So also we need to continuously monitor, monitor the ECG, heart rate, pulse, and oxygen saturation. We may need to calculate stroke volume, cardiac output, cardiac index before and after surgery. We may also need to measure the, uh, the, the pulmonary uh, blood pressure for us. Central pain, uh, central pain pressure, such like that, and then we, we, we may continue monitoring the ICU after the, after the surgery finish, and we gradually wind down the, the monitoring as the patient condition stabilized. This is a case of advanced monitoring. That, this is the CPB machine that I think Dr. Kenny's team usually, uh, yeah, this type uh, the cardiac surgery, that bypass cardiac surgery usually uses. You can see here the, the the uh, the the what we call it the pipe that goes to central pain and go out of the patient heart and this is this is what I did last night actually it's uh, very complex I just happened to uh, to get into patient who has soft, uh, septic shock and this is very complex condition because the patient has a burst abdomen abdomen which is a rupture of ileocecal it's already happened like for like three weeks, I think. And it has, the person also has a major blood loss. Oh, by the way, this is a young 26-year-old male. It uh, also pneumonia, uh, which has uh, oxygen saturation range from 79% to 97%. See here, we, in, uh, in the bottom right of the picture you can see that the oxygen saturation actually 89 uh, the blood pressure 132 over 61 and the heart rate is 104 and also the patient has also acute kidney failure which urium is 113 and creatinine 2.7 leukocytosis uh, which has a uh, uh, 50,000 of a leukocyte count thrombocytopenia with platelet count is 94,000 uh, well below the the normal 150,000. Isolacosid is well above the normal five to nine thousand uh, count of le uh, le Also, anemia. Uh, the hemoglobin is eight. Albumin is two point seven. 
This also, he was also on hemodynamic support drug, which is norepinephrine. You can see here the, the many uh, inf uh, syringe pump on ventilator support with midazolam, morphine, and leucoronium. And at this time, undergoing uh, surgery to repair the burst abdomen under anesthesia. So this is very difficult because patient has a lot of blood loss, but at the same time has also a good acute kidney failure. So that's where I cannot, uh, I cannot in, uh, replace the, uh, the, uh, uh, the blood loss aggressively with fluid. So I need really need to calculate the, the, the blood loss. Need, and then at the operation, we transfuse like eight bags of thrombocyte, four bags of plasma and two bags of pack rats. This was very, very stressful condi uh, uh, condition uh, for me as an anesthesiologist at the time. The operation lasts for four hours. It was quite a long operation. The, during surgery, the oxygen saturation range from 72 to 98. The blood pressure range from 60 to over 24 to 189 to 100, over 100. So it's very wide swing. So, but the thing is we need to consider all this condition here, need to understand the physiology, need to understand uh, all the pharmacology of the blood, of the, blood, uh, of the medicine, of the anesthetics that I use, also the, uh, the behavior of fluid that we turn to, behavior of the fluid and uh, the blood and also blood component that we transfuse to to uh, guide the patient safely uh, out of the operation. Okay, thank you. That's my uh, what uh, my like uh, presentation for this session. If you have any question, please ask. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ade, for amazing uh, presentation. I guess this is a very um, helpful and also useful for our uh, students and also for all the participants because uh, actually this topic also relates to our first uh, speaker, Dr. Kenny, about uh, heart and lung uh, surgical disease, which um, also involves uh, hemodynamic uh, monitoring, right, uh, in the operating room. But actually the... Um, the, actually, the hemodynamic uh, monitoring is uh, not for uh, operable patient only, but also for the uh, um, unoperable patient. I mean, yeah, so, um, condition. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so for the participants, if you already have question, you may uh, ask directly to our uh, speaker, Dr. Ade. If you hesitate to ask in English, you may you yeah, may ask yeah. in Bahasa Indonesia. I also speak Bahasa Indonesia. <laughs> okay, so feel free to ask in Bahasa or in English. Uh, it's okay uh, because this topic is very um, applicable. Yeah, applicable in our uh, knowledge for our knowledge. Okay, we get a question, Dr. Ade from. From Nur Aida, okay. The question is, okay. Okay, so based on your side, we all know that oxygen is a crucial thing in the world. We need them that much, but is there any case that we have too much oxygen inside our body? If the situation is real, what are the impacts to our body and what factors make the situation happen? Maybe that's all my question. Okay, Dr. Aida, can you get the question? Okay, yeah, I am, yeah, uh, the, we, yeah, uh, so oxygen is good, yeah, oxygen is good, we need oxygen, but is there any, any case that we would have too much oxygen inside our body? Yes, that's what happened to, to us, to, uh, to doctors and also nurses, yeah. This is what I see on my regular basis or regular practice. We, without any indication, prescribe oxygen to our patient. That's what not we're supposed to do. 
There is a reason why the oxygen in the air is 21% because we need that much for our body to survive. We don't need more than that unless we have medical condition that require us to have to need more oxygen from uh, uh, to our body. Um, so like this, uh, oxygen, too much oxygen, uh, high, very high pressure of oxygen may react with our body. So you see that oxygen is O2, right? And water is H2O. Water is so far is the largest component of our body. For men, it can be a uh, muscle, very muscular men, it can be like 65% of uh, body composition is water. For regular men, it's around 55 to 60% of uh, its body composition is water. For female, it's around 50 to 55%, depending on the fat tissue. Oxygen reacts, a uh, high concentration of oxygen with a high pressure of oxygen in our blood with, and then we, we, we collide it with water. What happened? Sometimes it becomes free radical. Has, oh, has two, what, hydrogen peroxide. So, uh, and hydrogen peroxide is not a good thing uh, to have uh, well, we have natu we naturally have hydrogen peroxide in our body, but it is not a good thing to have too much of hydrogen peroxide because hydrogen peroxide actually can kill our cells, can destroy our cells. Hydrogen peroxide is free radical. So from here, here I ask you all of uh, my colleagues and also doctors, please do not prescribe oxygen to a person or to patient or to ourselves if there is no medical condition that we got where we need the more oxygen because too much oxygen in our blood it is not a good thing especially for extended uh, extended time period that's why that's why we uh, uh, quickly lower the oxygen uh, of, uh, that we give to our patient in case if the, the patient stabilize, uh, the, the oxygen saturation increase, we just, uh, the, the heart, the work of the cardiovascular system is, uh, is relaxed. We, we decrease the, uh, the oxygen that we supply to our patient. We may need a lot of oxygen in our breathing air if we have like lung infection, such as, for example, Lung infection, where there is a thickening of our alveoli, it, or a feeling of fluid in our alveoli, it will prevent the, 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 ox, the oxygen to diffuse from the alveoli to the, to the bloodstream. That's, what, that's one, one, one condition that we may need a lot of uh, a high, high, a high, a very high con uh, concentration of oxygen in our breathing air. Because higher concentration more is more uh, is higher partial pressure. Higher partial pressure means more uh, more uh, more diffusion ability to cross the thicken the the thick uh, the thick uh, alveoli wall to the blood uh, the, to the blood vessel. So of course, when you need you have lung infection, uh, pulmonary infection, you may need uh, more oxygen in your breathing air. Other condition you may maybe you are under a lot of stress such as we are uh, you in sepsis you uh, you your body has an increase in metabolism uh, and then your cardiovascular cardiorespiratory system work really hard to to meet the oxygen demands of your body you may you may supply more uh, oxygen uh, to to uh, to your to 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 the patient so it it will help a little bit uh, of the of the work of the cardio respiratory system but we have to understand that too much oxygen too much pressure of oxygen is not good because the main the main carrier of the oxygen to our our tissue and body cell is not the plasma it is the hemoglobin it is just a waste of oxygen if the uh, if the, the we we just 
think of the hemoglobin as the vehicle, as the car of the bus that carry the passengers, which in this case is oxygen from like Jakarta, uh, from Serang to Jakarta. So the oxygen is the passenger and the blood and the hemoglobin is the bus. We need the bus to carry the passenger. Even though that we supply so many passengers in Serang, there is no way that it will go to Jakarta unless it, it has the vehicle, which is the bus. So too much oxygen is not good. It just will 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 make will will fill the the Pakupatan terminal if we say in Serang. Yeah. Just a lot of people there, but nobody. Uh, only a few people can go to Jakarta because the bus that available is only a very few bus. What well, very few very few buses? What happened to the terminal? So much, so many people. So many people want to get into the bus, but the bus is not uh, not not very uh, not many available. And instead of many people go to Jakarta, it's a lot of chaos that happening in the terminal, right? That's what will happen if you give too much oxygen to uh, to the blood uh, to the body. So too much oxygen is should be avoided. Do not give too much oxygen. That's why we have like monitor and oxygen saturation. So the oxygen saturation, if it is already good, it means you have already have enough oxygen. Why? And then after the oxygen saturation is uh, is high, why the patient still tachycardia? Because the oxygen supply to the to the tissue is still low. Why? Because because the vehicle that carry it may be still limited in my in my patient condition. Wait here. Let, let me share again. Yeah. Uh, let me share. Yeah. Okay. Okay. In my patient condition here, see the hemoglobin is eight. And I'm lucky to have this uh, heart rate is only 104. Uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning of surgery, the, uh, the heart rate is around 130 to 140. Why? Because uh, the patient needs a lot of uh, oxygen and the vehicle that carry the oxygen is the hemoglobin. Not many hemoglobins mean, mean not many oxygen that, that, can, uh, that can go to the body tissue. That's why inside uh, uh, here I tran uh, I uh, give a transfusion uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, blood transfusion so to to increase the hemoglobin level and then to increase I mean, to increase the vehicles that carry the oxygen and then of course to meet the uh, the requirement of our body cells that's what happened. There's uh, who asked this uh, Nur Aida Nur Aida. My my answer satisfy satisfy you or you you need to ask anything that's not clear yet. Is it clear, uh, Nur Aida, for the answer from Dr. Adi? Uh, yeah. Is it uh clear? But can I ask for further explanation? Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well. right. So uh, I just wanna ask if uh, so uh. Basically, it's not a uh, really a good thing to uh, if we had too much uh, concentration of oxygen inside our body. And then, uh, is uh, my uh, understanding is true that when we had uh, too much oxygen uh, concentration in our body, uh, the concentration the uh, the bunch uh, yeah the uh, big quantity of uh, concentration or the oxygen concentration in our body could create uh, a new molecule that oxygen bond together with other molecules and it could create a new molecule that could be harmful harmful for our body is that true yes that's harmful uh, hydrogen uh, oxy to, to high pressure of uh, oxygen can react with the water in uh, our body and it may create a free radical such as hydrogen peroxide. Yes. Okay, and yeah. then uh, you uh, you've uh, mentioned before that uh, the uh, the example of the harmful um, new molecule is like 
uh, peroksida O2 eh H2O2 ya yeah, H2O2 uh, H2O2 and then uh, if uh, the situation is happen like we have a uh, uh, find the situation when we have too much uh, oxygen level in our body could uh, the body uh, adapt that in in their usual way in, in their natural way like uh, their uh, would well, uh, lowering you, their concentration of oxygen no actually no you 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 may not you cannot actually it is very difficult to find high oxygen level in our body naturally because uh, we breathe oxygen is what the air that we breathe con uh, contains uh, like 20% of oxygen around at 20 sometime from 19 20 21 to 23 maybe less when we we go to high elevation such as mountain we actually less oxygen there so it is very unlikely to have very high oxygen level in our blood naturally we need to supply a lot of oxygen through like uh, like we need to have a supplementation of oxygen from oxygen uh, you know uh, the one that people usually bring everywhere to have an increased level of oxygen so you you do not have you don't have to worry that your body will have too much oxygen no unless you give it to yourself but here wait, let me uh wait, share something again all right wait wait uh, can i share something where is the share yeah. okay so this is uh, this is the example of uh, normal the number here the example of normal arterial blood gas uh, analysis see here you can see that po2 po2 mean pressure of oxygen and the third, uh, on the third line here po2 it means pressure of oxygen is 101.5 millimeter uh, hydrobium uh, uh, mercury millimeter mercury so the normal normal uh, oxygen pressure in our body is around 90 to 150 uh, around this level is really fine but will we have a hydrogen peroxide in our body yes hydrogen peroxide will occur naturally in our body and hydrogen peroxide in our body is actually useful it's useful to what to to eat all the uh, bacteria virus things like that that can harm our body actually peroxide hydrogen peroxide is useful in small quantity but we don't want that we do not want that hydrogen peroxide level to increase up because we just con uh, we just uh, breathe too much oxygen without uh, without indication so hydrogen peroxide we have it in our body naturally every day we have it and we need it but not too much we just need a little bit of it to help us to clear off all any debris or virus bacteria and, and things like that but we do not want to the level to increase. That's uh, Nur Aida. Okay, uh, I get your explanation. Thank you uh, for okay. the answer. Okay, thank you for your uh, for your uh, question. And next question is next from... question, Doctor Ade here. Uh, this is from Doctor Arya about um, patient in hemorrhagic shock condition. What is the best solution or liquid for resuscitation? Okay, uh, this of, of course a lot of answer. What is the best? The best is, well, what is the best? So we need to understand the physiology. The problem with blood loss is we, we lost mainly in the context of oxygen delivery, we lost the hemoglobin. In the context of oxygen delivery, we lost the hemoglobin. It means we lost the vehicle to transport oxygen to our tissues and, uh, and body cells. It also means that losing the vehicle to transport uh, the, the oxygen to our body cell, it means it gives a lot of stress on our cardiorespiratory system. We do not want that thing to happen for extended period. Okay, of course, we, we are grateful that our, 
our cardiorespiratory system can work really hard to to compensate the loss of hemoglobin, which is the loss of the vehicle that uh, bring uh, that transport our oxygen uh, from the lung to the body tissue. But we should not let them, that thing happen for a long time. So the best is, of course, replacing it with blood again, which is uh, loss of hemoglobin. We replace it with loss of hemoglobin. Loss of uh, what we call it, uh, uh, platelets, we replace it with platelet. Loss of uh, clotting factor, we replace it with clotting factor. Loss of protein, we'll, we replace it with protein. But the most important loss that we need to replace, of course, the hemoglobin, because the hemoglobin is the, uh, is the core of uh, the body metabolism. Our body metabolism will not sustain for long without enough oxygen. And the hemoglobin is the vehicle that transport the oxygen from the lung to our body tissue. So this is the question. We may, we may replace it for uh, temporarily with, uh, with uh, crystalloid, with colloid, but ultimately we need to replace the hemoglobin. The problem is uh, something we, we concern about the, the possibility of infection such as HIV, such as Hepatitis C, hepatitis B that may uh, may come in the blood bag. So, so that's why we uh, we need to do it uh, the transfusion carefully. But the best that we can do, of course, to replace the lost hemoglobin with hemoglobin. Too. That's what uh, that's my answer to the question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ade. I guess uh, this is very nice uh, discussion from our audience. Uh, let's go to the last question. I guess from Reina. Uh, it is yeah. It is yeah. about septic shock within the case of uh, COVID nineteen, which undergo convalescent plasma therapy. Would it be any way the therapy worsen the condition of the patient caused by cytokine storm? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. This is uh, convalescent is yeah has a lot of controversy. Uh, convalescent plasma mean the patient uh, the plasma from. Uh, uh, from survivor, so from survivor of uh, the in this in this uh, in this uh, case is COVID nineteen patient survivor. So, so we hope like actually the 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 pro the pro argument that the patient survive and then when we we we. Uh, we retrieve the plasma from the patient. The patient, uh, no, no, the, from the survivor. The survivor condition is already stable. It means the cytokine storm has passed. So the cytokines, that the bad cytokine that cause a lot of inflammation has, yeah, has gone. That's the pro. That's the pro argument. Uh, so would it be any way the therapy worsen the condition of the patient caused by cytokine? So the, the, the expected, uh, uh, the expected uh, what do you call it, uh, things from the convalescent plasma actually is the uh, immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin uh, from the survivor patient. So for most cases, I still believe that it, it doesn't worse. It is. It it does not worsen the condition of the patient. Uh, it, it it will not increase the cytokine uh, the cytokine storm in the in the COVID patient that received the uh, convalescent plasma. I believe so. But of course, the, there are some other some other treatment and that is commercially available uh, competing with this convalescent plasma. Of course. Uh, Sometimes I don't know. People have just has agenda. Uh, well, maybe what uh, they say true or no. It is very hard to prove because when they people want to promote their idea or want to promote something that they sell, they may say that something else is not is not really good. Uh, maybe that's the agenda. Maybe that's just the true. I don't really know actually, but I believe that the convalescent, uh, the convalescent uh, 
therapy does not uh, worsen the cytokine, cytokine storm in the COVID patient. Uh, if the other question will, will will it always beneficial? The answer is no, because if the 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 COVID variant is different, uh, maybe it's just not benefit. We we just don't know. The plasma convalescent maybe from uh, come from the uh, from the alpha variant, and uh, the patient now has a omicron variant. So the uh, so the the, uh, the anti, anti antibody to the alpha variant uh, just doesn't work to the omicron or delta variant. So the transfusion of plasma may not uh, has uh, uh, may not really benefit the patient, but I believe it doesn't worsen the cytokine storm. That's my answer. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Adi, for the explanation and also all the answers from our uh, for our uh, audience. And I guess uh, this is, uh, we already actually over time for our uh, guest lecture today. And we I'm sorry. Like, yeah. It's okay, it's okay, because uh, the discussion is very active from the uh, participant also. Uh, okay, I guess uh, the two topics already finished uh, and we already discussed about uh, a lot of questions, a lot of uh, interesting topics in our guest lecture today. And for the next session, uh, I'd like to invite doc, uh, Dr. Siti Farida, our Dean of Medical Faculty, for uh, giving certificate to our two honorable speaker, to Dr. Kenny Cheng and also to Dr. Ade. Is uh, Dr. Farida here? Oh, I guess not. Dr. Ernie, maybe, from the head of programs to uh, study medical faculty. Dr. Ernie, are you here? Yeah. All right, wait. Um, maybe I call to uh, Dr. Arya. Are you there? Okay, Dr. Arya, thank you. Uh, I, okay, for the certificate from the Dr. Kenny, can you uh, show from the multimedia? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Dr. Kenny. This is the electronic certificate from us. We hope uh, our uh, we can change our knowledge uh, next time. Thank you, Dr. Kenny. Okay, for the next speaker to add Dr. Ade Ikhwan. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ade. This is our lecture two. Uh, very nice for English lecture. So next time maybe uh, we we can make another uh, even more. Thank you, Dr. Adi, for the presentation. Okay. Thank, thank you, Dr. Arya. Arya. Yes. Uh, so thank you uh, to our speakers, so Dr. Kenny Cheng and also Dr. Ade. It is very uh, a lot of benefits from this topic, and of course we are ready for the next event, for the next seminar, and also uh, more interesting topics. Okay, uh, I apologize for any mistake. I give the floor to MC. Michael, time is yours. Maybe, Luisa, oh, there is Michael. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, so sorry. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Luisa. And I would like to ask the committee if there will be a photo session to including all of the all the participants that have been joining the lecture. Is there will be a photo session? Uh, yes, I, if you would like to a photo session, please screenshot. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, now uh, I would like to invite all the, all of the participants to turn on their camera uh, so we can take a photo to commemorate this wonderful moment. Okay, let's do that.
Enough, enough. Okay, thank you ya. Okay, you allow me to take uh, the photo. One moment. Okay, three on my mark. Three, one, two, three. Okay. Next slide. One. Two, three. Okay, the last slide. One, two, three. Okay, thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Yes, um, thank you so much, Dr. Kenny and Dr. Ade Ikhwan. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to also remind all the all of the participants to fill out the attendance form that has been shared by the committee uh, via Zoom chat. And finally, we've come to the end of the guest lecture. And it has been a wonderful evening with all of you. And thank you for attending the seminar. And I hope that the knowledge that have been shared by both Dr. Kenny and also Dr. Ade uh, we found today will become our stepping stone to achieve something greater. Uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, as an Master of Ceremony, I would like to uh, close this lecture. Wassalamualaikum. Salam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kenny, Dr. Ade.